Amen. If you have a copy of God's Word, I invite you to find your place in Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. So we've been studying this, at least this first part of uh, the book of Revelation as it is in unveiling who Jesus is. John writes seven letters, pens, seven letters, led by the Holy Spirit to, to seven literal churches. Literal churches that were in existence, not, <coughs> pardon me, not long after Christ ascended back to heaven. They were established. Seven letters of commands to seven literal churches. that no longer are in existence, but the application still applies to the Lord's churches today. And as we look tonight, we will look at the letter that John sent to the church at Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. And unto the angel... Of the church, Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the same of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, but zealous therefore, or be zealous therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in unto him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith under the churches. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you once again. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the instructions that come from your word. Lord, we ask tonight that you bless the reading of your word. And Lord, may we heed the instructions tonight. It's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. The church at Laodicea, we've talked about the other six churches, seven letters that go out at the same time, seven letters that are read at the same time. So every stop that these letters went, each church heard them. So can you imagine Laodicea? hearing about the previous, reading about the previous churches. Then it comes to this letter. Can you imagine the other churches hearing about, oh, I hope I never become like them. But here was a church sometimes I wonder if I'd enjoy it better if God just said I'm dead than to say I'm lukewarm and I just want to spit you out of my mouth. I mean, weigh, weigh that one out. You're dead or you make me want to vomit. Uh, you know. But that's where we're at here as we read. That's where Laos, the church at Laodicea was. And the things that 
Jesus, through John, tells this church were things that they had, had grown to not pay attention to. The things that Jesus instructed the church, there was no mistaking. They knew exactly what Jesus was saying. It's interesting that we see about Jesus in this and how Jesus reveals himself. You see, Laodicea was in the juncture of two very important, uh, they were imperial trade routes. And the Laodicea sat right smack in the middle. So if anybody was trading, if anybody was traveling, guess what city they came through? It was Laodicea. So what? guess what goes on in Laodicea? There's business. There's commerce. There's everything that you can imagine. And this is because of where Laodicea uh, sat. Five of the seven cities that, that John wrote to lay in order along one of the roads, Pergamum and Thyatira and Sardis and, and Philadelphia. So we're, we're some 40 miles to the, to the southeast of Laodicea. To the north was a sister uh, city, Heropolis, six miles north. And then 10 miles the other way was Colossae. And here was Laodicea that sat on this major trade route. If you're a business center, what do you need to do business? You need banking, don't you? Laodicea was a banking center place of commerce, the pastures around, the, the cotton that was growing. It, there was a special black cotton that was produced. What do, you, what do you have to have cotton for to make? The, not only was it a banking center, it was a clothing center, it was a manufacturing center. The textiles not only that, not only was it a banking center and a textile center, but, they didn't, but there was the, the medical side. Paleo de Steel was known for an eye side that, that would help medicate. And people would come from all over for these things. Here's a city that, boy, you're sitting pretty good, aren't you? Everybody's coming, everybody's buying things, everybody. Not only, so, I mean, if they're coming, they're staying. They were so self reliant that when the city was destroyed because of earthquake, in AD 60, Rome was willing to come in and provide financial relief. You know what Laodicea's response was? I would thank you, but no thanks. We don't need it. We can do this on our own. And so it was written, Laodicea rose from the ruins by the strength of her own resources with no help from us. That was Laodicea. And you look at Laodicea and think, that, you know, they've got it all together. Everything that they would need is right there at their disposal. But there was one problem. Laodicea had no water. Because they were on a plateau, they had to pipe water in. They would pipe water down from Heropolis Heropolis was known for the, the hot springs, the, the hot baths that they would go up to. And you, would, you would go in and dip and, and find relief. Or, they, and, or they, would, they would pipe in water from Colossae. Colossae was known for the, the, the cool, refreshing waters. 
waters of healing, waters of refreshing. But by the time water got to Laodicea, it was neither hot, it was neither cold, but it was lukewarm. Isn't that how we like our drinks? You know, the thing now is iced coffee, which I like. And I like hot coffee. You gotta have a cup of that in the morning. But if that cup sits for a period of time, anybody like taking a sip of that coffee? You use that coffee cup in the morning and you get about halfway done, you put it on the counter and Oh, that's my favorite cup. I'm going to come back the next day. Oh, I still got coffee here. Anybody take it and, and down it, wash it out, and use it again? What do you, you dump it, don't you? I mean, that, that coffee that sits in it, it's putrid, it, it, it's nasty. And that was a problem that Laodicea had as they're piping in water. I mean, you have the hot healing water. I mean, you still go to Heropolis today. And you see the deposits and all that. But as it's piped in and as it's sitting in the sun, can you imagine, what is it, was it 106 we saw on the car? 106 degrees on top of those pipes. Can you imagine what that water was like? And as it sits, the, 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 the minerals and everything from the hot springs, and as it sits, it just becomes... Nasty, and that was the problem that Laodicea had. And so, as Jesus approaches and discussing what is going on with the church at Laodicea, he's going to use those very same things that that, that there would be no mistake. They would know exactly what is going on. Just like every church previous to this letter, when Jesus speaks, there is no mistake. And we see not only about Laodicea, but we see about who Jesus is. The first thing I want us to, to notice is the certainty of Jesus. In, in verse 14, chapter 3, These things saith the amen. In, in previous church letters, Jesus is describing himself as the one whole, you know, the, he, he describes things with the, the lampstands and, 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 and the candlestick and, and all this, but here, but here's a name. This, this, there is no describing. I am the Amen. You know, here's the thing about amen. It means affirmation, doesn't it? If you agree with what is said in church, what usually is said? Amen. It means affirmation. It's a transliterated word from the Hebrew that, that means truth. It means that which is firm, that which is unchangeable. It, it affirms a, a truthfulness of a statement. Another word that we see the, the Greek amen in the King James Version, verily, comes alongside meaning the, the same thing that in the New American Standard we use the word truly. If you want to talk about modern English, it's for sure, for sure. And Jesus says, I am the amen. Because what? Jesus has confirmed that God's promises are true. Jesus has confirmed that God's word is true. I am the amen. I confirm everything. And so beginning, as he begins to to, to speak to this church. 
He wants to listen. What I have to say is true. I confirm what God the Father says. He also says, look what else he says in verse 14. The certainty of Jesus, not only is the amen, but I am the faithful and true witness. Not only do I confirm truth, I speak truth. So church at Laodicea, what I'm fixing to say, I want you to know I'm con- it's been confirmed with God, but what I'm fixing to say is, is truth. Isn't that what Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 6? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Isn't it interesting that Pilate says what is truth? And truth is standing in, his, in the very midst of his presence. And he asks the question, what is truth? So not only Revelation, folks, but listen, we must understand when Jesus speaks, it's truth. When we open up God's Word and we read and Jesus is speaking, guess what? It's truth. What's the statement? You can take that to the bank. But that's how, that's what Jesus, when Jesus speaks, there is no if, ands, or buts. There is no wondering. And Jesus to the church says, listen, I'm confirming truth. I speak truth. But look what else he says. I am the beginning of the creation of God. You know, it's interesting also. You know, we know, Pete, we, we, read, we, know, we read of different ones that will take God's word and stretch it and twist it and, and to make it. And the English translations, they, you know, they, 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 it says the, the beginning of the creation of God. But listen, that's not what, when we think the, the beginning of the creation of God, there are those that say, ha, ah, there, see, right here. Jesus is a created being. We have been yelling this, we have been teaching this, we have been trying to prove this. Look, right here, even in God's Word, it says He's the beginning of the creation of God. Well, here's the thing, the Greek word, the beginning, doesn't mean that Christ was the first person that God created, but what it means is that Christ is the source or the origin of all creation. So not only do I not only do I speak truth, I've created. I, I was there creating. In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 13, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. If we were to flip over to John chapter 1 and verse 3, all things were what? made by him and without him was not anything made that was made that's jesus could it be that as jesus is as as john jesus speaking john is writing that the church of laodicea what was suffering from some of the same things as their sister church down the road in colossi you see colossi in, in Paul's time was, was having a problem with Gnosticism and the secret knowledge. And Paul addressed this in, in the book of Colossians, in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers all things Paul's writing this to the church at Colossae all things were created by him and for him and he is before all things and by him all things exist when Paul writes about it, him being the firstborn not that he was the firstborn but it, it has to deal with him being the supreme the preeminent one, the one who is to receive the highest honor. 
And that's how Jesus opens the to Laodicea. This, I want you to, I want to remind you really the certainty of who I am. I'm not just some old, old Joe Schmo speaking. I am the preeminent one. I am the truth. I speak the truth. I confirm the truth. I am the truth. I was in the beginning creating it. You know, sometimes we just need to be reminded and get a new view of who Jesus is. We get doing, going and doing the same things over and over. How easy is it to get into a rut? You don't have to answer, but how many times have, we, have you been in a spiritual rut before in your life? And what does it take to get out of that spiritual rut? It's not that Jesus has changed his appearance. We've just forgotten who Jesus is. But he is the truth. And as he lays this out to the church at Laodicea, in verses 15 and 17, look what he says. I have an issue with you. Let me just stop here. If Jesus was writing to us, just think, just let's just, if you want to call it make believe, role play, just just say we were on the lat the end of this list of letters. And every other one's being read before this one. And you hear. Uh, you're doing good, but I have this against you. You've lost your first love. Whew. Man, I don't want to be like them. And oh, you're dead. Ooh, I don't want to be like them. Hey, I'm giving you say if you would do this and repent and okay. Can you imagine? just being a, a member at Laodicea and what might be going through your mind as this is being, and then it comes to this letter. And at the same time, you think, hey, I'm a pretty good church member. I have a good business. I tithe. I do this, I do that. We are in a vibrant city. A city that is alive. And Jesus says, <laughs> I know your works. You get, you get, you get a, almost the edge of your seat. Ha, <laughs> he knows our works. Woohoo! This is going to get good. He knows what we've been doing. And then the boom comes down. You're neither hot nor cold. I would rather you be hot or cold. Some take this as being a message of when you read this of who a church that needs to, to, you know, they need to get high and get on fire with God. Or a church that is just, just cold and that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Because he brings in what actually is going on in Laodicea. It's not about being a, a hot church or, or a cold church. It's about being a putrid church. A, a church that is just like that water that just sits. I mean, if the water's not hot and the water's not cold, really, listen. Would you consider it useless? How about that coffee that sits in that cup? The only thing it's worth doing is making that ring around the inside of the cup. I mean, I don't know about you, but I ain't touching it. As much as I like drinking coffee, oh, I'll just pour in a hot pot and just mix it. No! I might use the same cup. It drives Becky crazy. 
But you know what? I have my favorite cups. That coffee tastes good in my favorite cups. If it means I dump it out and I rinse it out a little bit and then put coffee in, okay, that's okay. But listen, I'm not going to put coffee, fresh coffee in, in, in day-old coffee or lukewarm coffee and mix it up and say, oh, it's okay. Because listen, it's not. And that's what Jesus, it's not about a church that, oh, there's a message of getting fired up. It has nothing to do with about getting a fired up hot church. He said, I'd rather you be spiritually alive or I'd rather you be cold that, that totally reject that there is no spiritual response. But if you're lukewarm, you're in a useless condition. And that's exactly what Jesus, Jesus hit on the water supply. They could not be, they knew about lukewarmness. They knew of the smell they, came. they knew of the, the process of having to boil to, to clean up the water once they got it there. They knew the, you know, the aromas that would come through the, through the windows as they're trying to boil all these impurities out. John Stott, in his book, What Jesus Thinks of the Church, said perhaps none of the seven letters is more appropriate to the 20th century church than this. It describes vividly the respectable, sentimental, nominal, skin-deep religiosity which is so widespread among us today. Our Christianity, he says, is flabby and anemic. We appear to have taken a lukewarm bath of religion. You know what? That's a problem. Because, folks, it's never been about religion. But it's always about a relationship with Jesus Christ. He says, so because you're, you're lukewarm, neither hot nor or cold nor hot, I do. That word is, we get the word vomit from. I mean, vomit. That's what Jesus says. Is there anything pretty about vomit? I felt sorry for a couple last night. Went to eat dinner. We're coming through the door. Out comes a gentleman holding his daughter. Oh, sorry. Sick kid, I mean, he just come busting out. And he, he was about my, he might have been a little bit taller than me. I mean, but he was, sick kid, boom. And right there in front of the, the cashier where you check in, that poor little girl had gotten sick. And out it came. And it was funny because it was some younger uh, kids they had no idea what to do. They were, I mean, they're kind of looking like this and they asking them, Mom, uh, do you, you still want to eat and order? It's like, they're like, no. Can I at least get a bag to take out? And Because she was outside doing the job all over again. And we're sitting there like, Whew. you feel sorry about the, you know, the fine, but that is just nasty. Your kids do it, and it's in that, that, that bedroom, and you go to the door, okay, I'm going to suck it up, I'm going to, we've been there, and, and I'm not going to breathe. You go in, work a little bit, huh? Because it's, it's nasty. There's nothing pretty about it. And Jesus says, that's your condition. Makes me want to just puke it out. That's probably not a good church word, but that's, it just makes me want to puke. And he says this, look in verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Notice that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Here was a church that was acting just 
like the city, taking in everything about the city. You think you're rich, huh, banking, but you're really, you're poor. You think you're clothed, huh, the manufacturing, but you're naked. You think you can see medical, eye salve, but guess what? You're blind. That's what Jesus said. This is what's going on. You're just like you are self-relying. And when you self-rely, you're useless. That was Jesus' concern. But I want to see real quick Jesus' command. Look in verse 18. Here's what I do. I, I counsel you. Stop relying. Do we find ourselves self-relying from time to time? And, you know, let's be honest, we, we, we don't mean it, but we just we do it. Listen, when we're, we're not seeking God's power for ministry and for kingdom work, then whose power are we trying to go on? If we're not seeking the, spirit of the, the power of the Holy Spirit as we're witnessing, when we're witnessing, whose power are we witnessing on? Whose words are we wit using? It's ours. It's a self-reliance. And many times we, we get to a point we don't even realize that. And here's what Jesus says. Stop relying on this stuff. But here's what I do. I want you to buy of me. Here was the commerce part of Laodicea. Come buy of me. I counsel you to, to buy of me gold that is tried in fire. What happens when you take gold or any kind of precious metal and you put it to the fire? What happens? Same thing as you boil water. It, 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 it takes out the impurities. You come to me and you buy of me. I'm giving you the good stuff. Really, that's what Jesus is. I'm giving you the best stuff that thou mayest be rich. You want to be rich? Come buy from me. You want to be clothed? He says in white raiment that you might be clothed. That white showing purity. That the shame of thy nakedness does not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve. Listen, you come buy of me the ointment. can make you see and as many as I love I rebuke and chasten be zealous therefore and repent buy of me take my clothes take my ointment here's the thing about a church folks self confidence will weaken a church when our confidence is found in ourselves we're heading down a road of trouble our confidence must and better be in Jesus Christ self-confidence weakens. listen self-reliance blinds we, we, we rely on our own stuff, our own self, our, you know, whatever, our history, our pedigree. Our, listen, we'll be blinded to what the real need is. We'll be satisfied. And here's the thing. Not only is self-confidence weak and self-reliance blind, but self-satisfaction loses. When we become satisfied, we lose the zeal. We lose the passion. We lose the energy. Jesus said, those that I love, I rebuke. Didn't you do that to your own kids? Did you discipline your kids? 
bring your kids because you have flu. Why, why do you discipline your Because you love them. As a kid, you hate to hear that this hurts me more than you. I don't know how many times I heard that. But you, you discipline, you rebuke. Why? Because you love your kids. We're just waiting for the day when, as Maven grows up, and that first rebuke that, that Tommy has to do, we're going to say, ha, ah, we've been there. He's going to come in to, to church one day and be like, oh, man, Maven, I just, I got to tell, just release and tell someone what he's been doing and had to rebuke him. And, and we're like, yeah. By that time, we, we you know, we, we have done it for a while. And, but you, re, you do that just as Jesus, because you love. Jesus says, Repent. I rebuke, I chasten. Be zealous. We get away from, we, we, if we are to get to being zealous, then we must get away from being self-satisfied and find our satisfaction in who Jesus is and allow the Spirit to, to pour into us the zeal and the passion and the energy. Be zealous and Repent. But look what Jesus says as we end this. He says, I stand at the door and knock. You know what's interesting? We'll use that, that phrase and talk about Jesus standing at the door and knock. You need to be saved. But folks, this letter is being sent to a church. Jesus said, I'm standing at the door of the church and knocking. He's knocking, trying to get the attention of the church. I have something to say. The question is, folks, are we at a place where we can hear what Jesus has to say to us? Are you at a place? He's asking the church, let us open their door to hear what he has to say. Why? Because he wants the church to overcome. Folks, realize Jesus, if you want to, part of the time, he has skin in the game. Better yet than skin, he has blood in the game, doesn't he? What did Jesus shed for what? His church. His own blood. He says, I'm knocking. If you open, I want to come in. I want to speak. I want to I want to pour into you. I want to sup with you. I want to I want to fellowship with you. Yes, you may be lukewarm, but that's not where I want you to be. By coming in, I want to help get you where I want you to be. As I was thinking about this you know, two reasons came to my mind why you don't open the door when someone's knocking. First one was this. You're scared of who's on the other side of the door. You ever had those knocks at 2 in the morning? You, you know, at 2 in the morning, you really can't look out that peephole and see what's out there. Or remember as a kid, you know, those first few times you, you get to stay home and mom and dad's locking the door, do not what? Answer that phone and, or answer that door and boy, then something, maybe a knock comes and phew, you scurry to that back. You're, the kid scurries to the back room or 
feel like us, they scurry upstairs. Or I think Sarah Beth one time says she heard a noise and she went and grabbed her softball bat. And but you don't open a door because you're scared of who's on the other side. The other reason you don't want to open is you don't want to be bothered with on the other side. Have you had those before? How about a couple, a couple people that come up in their white shirts and ties? Or two or three come up and, oh, I, I don't want to mess with them today. Now, that's a whole other message of God, someone that needs the gospel to your doorstep. But we don't open because we don't want to be bothered on who's the other side. Is that the same with Jesus? Jesus says, I'm knocking. And if you would open, I want to come in. I want to sup with you. I want, I want to sit at your table. But here's the thing, folks. We've got to be willing to open. You know, I heard it said a church is like an airplane. A, a jet engine does not have brakes. It's either thrusting forward or in reverse. And when the jet stops going forward, guess what happens? An airline pilot describes landing a large jetliner under the best of circumstances as a well-controlled crash. That really makes you feel good to get on a plane the next t time you have to, but it's a well-controlled crash. The same is true with a local church fellowship. When a church stops moving forward, when a church loses its vision, when a church stops being passionate about Jesus and his plan for the committee, uh, uh, <clears throat> community, they are heading for a rough landing. Let me ask you tonight. Jesus, who said, as he's speaking to the church at Laodicea, there's application for us. Jesus says, I'm knocking. I want to come in. I want to give you words. I want to give you strength. I want, I want to sup with you. The question is, are you willing to open the door? Are you willing to let the, open the door and let him in? Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you. And Lord, many times... We do try to rely on our own strength. And Lord, I ask you forgive us for that. Lord, we look to you for all power and all enabling. Many times we rely on our own self and Lord, nothing happens. Actually, it's, it makes things worse. And we're sorry for that. Lord, help us I always look to the Holy Spirit, look to you for the strength, the direction, the instructions. Everything that we need, our fulfillment, may it be found in you. Lord, as you knock, give us strength to open the door. And Lord, may we be able to be willing to sit down with you as you sup with us. May we not be lukewarm, but useful for you, the master, the business, the kingdom work that you have for us to do. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I ask you to please stand. We're going to have a